Hello, everybody. It's Margaret Spellings. I'm the president and CEO of Texas 2036, and we have a terrific uh, chat this afternoon with my friend and former colleague, Dr. Mark McClellan, who is serving as one of three chief medical advisors to Governor Abbott's task force. Uh, he and I have known each other since we were colleagues at the White House together when he worked on the Council of Ec Economic Advisors and went on to leave the FDA and the CMS and uh, has an incredible pedigree combination of health and economic expertise and anywhere we're delighted. I feel like I see you all the time, Mark, because you're on CNN all the time and there's my buddy, Mark McClellan. So anyway, welcome and thank well, you. Well, Mark, it's great to be, be on with you and you forgot the most important part, which is fourth generation Texan. And uh, that, and there Austin, is that. Going and, to and, University and, of Texas, so don't forget exactly, that. Exactly, <laughs> absolutely. And of course, uh, uh, leading our discussion today will be the founder and chairman of Texas 2036, my friend, uh, Tom Luce, who is himself a health policy policy expert, having studied at the School of Hard Knocks along the way, and all around. I've got a lot of underlying conditions, Mark. <laughs> all around data geek. So uh, jump in, Tom. Let's have a discussion about where we are in Texas, and I'll, I'll keep you all uh, on time uh, and uh, take it away. Mark, when, when I look at complex subjects like this, I always like to focus on making sure I understand what I don't know yeah. <laughs> so I don't rush off a cliff. And it seems to me there are just so many unknowns with this pandemic. Can you just generally help uh, the public understand how much we don't know about this pandemic? Well, Tom, there is a lot we don't know, but we're learning more, and that's why I think we're having a good discussion now about the best way for Texas and other states to, to reopen their economy and get to a new normal. We're going to be living with this virus for a while, uh, but we can do, I think, much better than we're doing now. At the beginning, we really couldn't even detect how widely the virus was spreading in our communities, and that's what led to both the big surge in cases that were just finishing living through now, uh, where a number of healthcare systems and regions around the country were overwhelmed and every single one of them uh, has been taxed with getting their ICUs uh, staffed up, getting more ventilators, uh, really putting some stresses on our, uh, on our healthcare professionals all over the country. And we took the extreme steps of social isolation that people are still living through now because that's the best way to slow down the spread of the virus when you don't know anything else, when you don't have any other tools in the armamentarium. So that's starting to change. In the months ahead, we're gonna see better treatments. It's not clear how fast those are going to come, but there are a lot of promising therapies in development from antivirals to drugs that may help with the most severe and extreme cases to new kinds of antibody-based treatments that uh, really uh, uh, amazing scientific advances that go right after the, the virus, as well as uh, vaccines in development, as you know. But that's gonna take some time. In the meantime, we've gotten better at doing testing to detect the virus. We know some steps that can help prevent its spread, uh, even though it is a very contagious uh, virus. Uh, there, we know more about steps that we can take to contain it. So putting those steps together I mean that it's going to be a gradual process going forward from here as we, on the one hand, keep learning more about what works to contain the virus while uh, we do more activities. And on the other hand, uh, keep making progress in the science, the, the diagnostics, the therapeutics, the, uh, the steps that are going to put this virus behind us eventually. Uh, we've just got a period to live through where there is going to be some uncertainty and there are going to need to be some significant modifications for people to stay safe while we're trying to, to grow our economy. And Mark, I think the general public, you know, hears so much about quote testing, close quote, and of course that means different things to professionals such as you. Mm -hmm. Can you kind of delineate for the general public the, the subject of testing diagnostic versus antibodies, the treatments versus testing per se versus vaccines, just as you mentioned all of those words, but I wanna make sure everybody's focused on the differences. Yeah, let's focus on testing. And I think there are two kinds of tests that are most important for people to be thinking about. The ones that are most important right now in the short term are tests for whether or not you actually have a, a COVID-19 infection and are shedding the virus and can give it to other people. So that's the test that we need to make sure that people who do have a COVID-19 infection 
take extra steps to stay isolated, uh, not be around other people. Uh, hopefully that we can trace their contacts, people they were in close contact with before they're around a lot of other people to make sure they don't have COVID-19 either. So diagnostic tests are really important for those steps. They're also very important for people who are working in high risk situations or living in them. So think about the outbreaks that have occurred in nursing homes where there are a lot of people at high risk for complications from COVID-19 and workers who may inadvertently transmit the virus to them because they don't have any or, or many symptoms. So these tests for the presence of the virus are really important for helping us contain further spread of the virus as we move out of this extreme distancing phase. You know, right now, most people are basically acting as if they had the virus. You know, if you're staying at home, if you're not around anybody else, you're not gonna transmit it. And that has worked, that has brought down the, the surge yes. in cases. We're seeing a decline in Texas and other parts of the country. Now we're trying to keep that decline going while we start doing more. And so testing for the presence of the virus is very important for that. The other kind of important test uh, more down the road is testing for immunity. These are the so-called serologic tests or antibody tests. And those can tell you whether you've got um, antibodies and your whether you've got antibodies in your system to the COVID-19 virus. And that's important for knowing whether you've been exposed before and whether you will be protected by your immune system, by these antibodies from getting the virus again. Unfortunately, those tests just aren't there yet to the point where we can really use them reliably. Uh, first off, it's hard to design these tests so they're really accurate for COVID-19 and don't just turn up positive because you had uh, um, a cold virus uh, um, before. Remember the, the coronaviruses, which include common colds as well as COVID-19, are very similar viruses. And we're also still learning about just how much immunity people get and how long they keep it when they get a COVID-19 infection. And there's still some questions about, you know, if you have a very mild case, do you, do you actually get a strong level of immunity? How long do you keep your immunity once you have it? We're gonna learn more about those questions in the weeks ahead. So I do see a day coming in the not too distant future where people will, really will be able to get reliable tests for whether they've been exposed and whether they're immune, but that's still weeks to a few months off, I think. In the meantime, we really need to focus on the test for the presence of the virus, because even though it's been around us, even though it's in all of our communities, the vast majority of Americans, and I think the vast majority of the people of Texas have not been exposed, do not have immunity, and could both suffer consequences directly and spread the virus if they're exposed to it again. So that's why the, the diagnostic test for whether or not you have an infection right now with COVID-19 are a, a really key part of this next phase in dealing with the pandemic of us trying to go back towards a, towards a new normal. And as I hear you talking about the gradual reopening and what I've called baby steps or gradual progress, how, how do you think about when you need to throttle back or it's okay to move ahead? In other words, I would assume you have to look at healthcare system capability to handle if you have a sudden spike, are you okay from the healthcare system standpoint? That's right. One very important marker of whether we're on the right course and can keep taking further steps or whether we need to pull back or at least uh, slow down and pause is how hard hit our healthcare systems are. Remember, we not only need extra healthcare system capacity around while we're dealing with the pandemic in case there is a new outbreak. We don't want to see surge situations like happened in New York City or happened in Italy uh, ever happen again and certainly not ever happen in Texas. But we also need to make sure our healthcare system can work for the people who need it, who have all the other healthcare problems that go along with life that are going to cause health consequences if we don't treat them either. You know, getting the, uh, the, the breast lumps taken care of, getting checked for, uh, getting other vaccinations that kids need and uh, getting procedures done that, that deal with uh, heart disease, cancer, other potentially life-threatening conditions too. So we need to have enough capacity for our healthcare systems to do that as well. So one very important marker as we go forward is what are our healthcare leaders telling us about, are they ready? Do they, do they have enough capacity? Do they have enough 
protective equipment uh, to deal with both uh, a potential surge again in local cases and to, to do what they need to do for uh, the, the core health needs of the people of Texas. And along with that, another milestone besides the readiness of our healthcare systems locally is how many cases we're seeing locally. Uh, as you know, what's happened around the Texas, a bit, around the state has been very different from community to community with some bigger outbreaks in more urban areas, but also some outbreaks in specific nursing homes and in some rural communities too. So anybody can get hit, nobody, no community is completely immune. And as we go forward, if there are outbreaks in some areas, we may need to, to pause or, or, or pull back a little bit in those areas in terms of the, uh, of the reopening steps. So it's, it's very important to have data on the number of new cases, that's where testing comes in, or if we don't have full testing available everywhere right away, at least good tracking on symptoms uh, that go along with COVID-19, respiratory illnesses and, and things like that. So that's- You that's know, Mark, a lot, I, let me interrupt along those lines because I've been a big fan of the Dell Medical School and I know you've done a lot of work with them. Um, they've really focused over time on population health. And of course, tracing is gonna be a huge issue here. And in other words, the way I tend to think about this, we've, we've of necessity been isolating a huge amount of our population. Yeah. And the question is, how do you move to isolating less of our population, more of our vulnerable population, those that are sick, and a right. part of that, it seems to me, is tracing. How do we begin to think about the capacity to trace? And I know there's well, not an easy coming, answer to that, but yeah, Dell a, Medical a, School's got to be in the forefront. Yeah, Dell Medical School is. You know, I'm, I'm proud to be part of the Dell Medical faculty. I'm a senior advisor there, even though my primary job is at Duke. I um, work with them uh, regularly, including on the response to COVID-19. And this is the kind of population health threat, population health problem that Dell Medical was built uh, to address. Uh, Dell's uh, researchers are part of a team advising the state on how to put in place a, a testing and tracing capacity, not only in Central Texas, but models and approaches that can be adopted around the state so that we can, as you say, identify new cases when they occur and uh, trace the contacts around those cases, the close contacts, uh, test them and, and quarantine those individuals if necessary. So that's like a, a very mini version of the isolation steps that everybody's had to live through over the past weeks. But if we can do the test and tracing, we can really contain those outbreaks. That outbreak. So it is some inconvenience for the people involved to be in isolation while the illness runs their course and be monitored to have a bit of quarantine time while we make sure that they weren't infected if they were close to someone who was but that kind of very contained targeted effort based on good data and analytics and on a combination of community health workers and public health and um, and uh, 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 leaders from institutions like Dell Medical is the way forward for the state of Texas now while we're doing all of that we do need to pay special attention and uh, to people who are older, to people who have multiple. Now you're getting patients. personal, Mark. Now you're getting personal. <laughs> well, Tom, I, I you know, I, it, it is a, it is a bigger risk. Uh, the COVID-19, unfortunately, is a bigger risk for, uh, for, for yeah. people who are, you know, 70 years young or, or, or similar. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Your I, lives. And I'm really glad that this um, epidemic hasn't been tougher on kids. You know, it's very different from influenza um, outbreaks, which are, are usually much harder on, on younger individuals than older. Um, so that's one good thing about this. But the flip side is that this is a tough pandemic, tough epidemic for older people in particular. And just as, you know, sometimes with the flu seasons, if there are outbreaks, schools have to close down, close down, kids are most affected. This is the other way around. So even though Texas and other states are going to be taking steps to open up, those steps need to be different and much more uh, baby steps, as you were saying, for, for people who are older, who have heart disease or respiratory conditions or other conditions that place them at greater risk. And that's not to say you just need to stay home, but I would be more careful as the sure. restaurants open up and the stores open up to only go to places where there is a lot of distance, maybe spend a bit more time outdoors in the open areas of all the, the great parks in, in Texas and 
uh, and things like that, and uh, still be very careful about staying away from uh, contact with lots of other individuals or going to places where lots of other uh, individuals may have left some, uh, uh, some chance of getting infected by the virus. Margaret, you've been strangely silent. I mean, this isn't like you, so I mean, <laughs> jump in there. Well, I, I, Mark, just from a, a resourcing uh, point of view, uh, it, where what we're seeing here in Texas is a lot of activism and activity from county judges and mayors and sort of these local mm. efforts. Um, talk about how we wrap state policy and those local efforts together and make sure we've got the hip bone and the leg bone connected. Uh, well, this is uh, avoid this confusion. Is yeah, it's a great question because this is a, an epidemic that, that will continue to be a risk for every single community in the United States. The level of that risk differs, but the chance of an outbreak really is still there everywhere in the U.S. And so there needs to be an effective multi-level response for um, your, the, the people who are joining us on, on this uh, 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 broadcast who are interested. Uh, our program at Duke has worked on a number of reports for how to go about um, uh, reopening and what the role of the federal government versus state and local governments are, especially in these important activities like uh, testing and tracing and containing further outbreaks. And uh, basically, there's a very important role for the federal government. Uh, there have been you know, unprecedented legislation at the federal level to provide economic relief to individuals, to businesses. That needs to continue, but we need to move more in the in our future stimulus legislation in the direction of preventing further outbreaks. So more funding will be coming from the federal government to states and local governments to help support uh, this kind of testing and tracing capability to help uh, provide healthcare providers shore up their abilities to do testing, to pay for some of these tests and the like. But the actual execution of these programs is gonna happen a lot at the state and local level. You know, just as over the past month when we had the surge, the, the governor and, and local leaders had to get together and figure out what the hospital capacity was, where they were going to get the ventilators they needed, how they were going to staff all of this. We've got more surges like that coming, like making sure we have enough tests available and that we can get the test locally to everybody who needs it. And then making sure in every local community, we've trained up some additional special workers for the COVID-19 era to help with contact tracing and other steps that are needed to support people who have to be isolated at home, uh, including some of the seniors and people with chronic conditions. Uh, there, there's some new kinds of work that needs to be done, and that all depends on local communities coming together, hopefully with strong federal and state support. One more Can question for me. Yeah. Obviously, uh, you're uh, you know, uh, sitting on a university campus. Uh, what advice do you have for schools and universities, um, and you know, as you know, they're so integral to the fabric of our regular workplace. I mean, parents yeah. can't go back to work without kids being in school. And Yeah, yeah, so and how Margaret, I know how much you care about education. Um, opening schools and opening uh, daycare and preschool programs, I think is absolutely critical. They're, they're not the easiest to open because that is some interaction uh, among a, a number of kids but it's absolutely crucial to not only the, the well-being of children and their further development, but also for making it possible for everybody else to, to start getting back to work. We've, we've got to take care of our, our kids in this process. There is a lot of good work going on now about how such uh, of a, a reopening of uh, preschool programs and, and elementary schools all the way up to high school can occur. I think what people are going to see is that to that start to happen soon in the weeks ahead. Uh, again, maybe it's not going to be exactly like it was before. Uh, smaller uh, classes, smaller groups, uh, maybe less exposure to multiple teachers, maybe staggered hours for some of the uh, educational programs. But I would predict that we will have some uh, programs from pre-K all the way up through high school uh, in place in the fall. I certainly think it's a top priority for all of us to work together uh, to make happen. Uh, that, again, it's going to take some work to get there. Now, universities, especially global universities that bring people in from all over the country and all over the world, like the University of Texas and uh, Duke University, right. that's a special challenge because on top of uh, all of the close proximity for the, the students involved, you've also got people coming in and out from all over the world. So I think universities are going to look a little bit different when they think about reopening in the months ahead. And 
fall programs, again, maybe more spaced out uh, classes, uh, uh, more instruction that's by video or in small groups, mm -hmm. and, and probably a bit less of the, the international uh, connections and, and a bit less of the travel. But, but you're right, education is critical to our future. Uh, it's been great to see all the responses so far by teachers, professors. I just finished my last Zoom class uh, earlier uh, uh, this week, um, but we've got to keep making progress there too, starting with the, the youngest kids and, and, and moving on up, I think. Yeah, it's a real problem for us. Before I give Tom the floor well, back, I just want to say a shout out again to Lisa Kirsch and Tom, we're about out of time, so yeah. you have the last word. And we'll let One last question, Tom. and it may be, and I'll, I'll make it as brief as I can. We have to deal with tyranny of the urgent and the gradual opening, which you're doing. How do we think about, even begin to think about preventing this from happening in the fall or a second wave or a third wave? How do, what do we need to start thinking about, Mark? I know it's not tyranny of the urgent, but what are some of the issues we need to think about? Well, that's a really good question. Uh, a lot of, uh, science experts, epidemiologists, and others think there is a real risk of another big wave in the fall. Uh, frankly, there's a risk of waves before then. If we don't take steps like we've just been describing, there's no reason to think that the summer would be that much different from, from April uh, if we just go back to what we were doing. So all of these incremental steps, all this extra support for containing further outbreaks of the, uh, of the epidemic is, are really important in the meantime. By the fall, I sure hope we have in place a really strong uh, strengthened healthcare system that can deal with the potential surge, a really good capacity for testing and tracing outbreaks. By that time, we'll hopefully have a lot of experience with collecting the needed data and, and figuring out how to um, use digital technologies and, and work together to, to contain these um, uh, the, the, the potential smaller outbreaks in the meantime. Also by fall, we'll hopefully have some of those therapies uh, more available, um, treatments that are at least somewhat effective against the virus and, and somewhat effective in the most serious cases. Uh, but it is a real risk, and that's why it's so important to take the step-by-step -step approach we're talking about now. That's going to put an infrastructure in place and get all of us used to what we need to do together to contain further outbreaks. And uh, hopefully that will prepare us well for the fall. Um, i got to say, uh, I know we're finishing up now, but uh, I do have a, a lot of optimism about the future. There are unprecedented efforts underway. Yeah, there really are. New therapies and then uh, uh, developing uh, vaccines. We are going to get through this, and we're hopefully going to get through this with a healthcare system, and a public health system, and a, an attention to, uh, to keeping people well and, and, and monitoring and helping everybody prevent health risks that will make our uh, our, uh, the population of, our, of, of Texas, the population of our country, much healthier for the future. Amen. Thank God you're Thank a Texan, you. Mark. Great <laughs> note to end it Great on, Mark. Thank you. you so much for your leadership and all you're doing, and uh, we'll do this again, I hope, soon. Uh, uh, Thank you. Thanks for all your leadership as well. Take care. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.